Hi, I'm Angus Cress Gillespie, your host for East Brunswick Television. I'm here today with Michael Gabriel to discuss his latest book, Colonial Taverns in New Jersey, Libations, Liberty, and Revolution. This is actually his fifth book, all published by Arcadia Publishing slash The History Press. A lifelong Garden State resident, he's a 1975 Montclair State University graduate. He's worked as a journalist, freelance writer, and author for more than 40 years. And it's my pleasure to welcome him to our studio today. Michael, uh, I'm fascinated with your book, Colonial Taverns of New Jersey. It's about 200 pages in length. It's chock full of photographs. Yes. It's readable. It's accessible for the general reader. Yes. At the same time, I was pleased, uh, speaking as a professor, there's actually footnotes there. Everything is, is documented. So in a way, you have it both ways. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, my my publisher was is very keen on footnotes or, or endnotes now, as they're called. Yes. Um, Boy, what a process that was. Uh, <laughs> it, it, well, it, it makes it responsible and yeah. authoritative. Yes, yes. So uh, I'm, I am using good sources. I don't want to, you know, be accused of, you know, stealing anybody's information. I try to give credit where credit's due. Yeah. And I think that I think that's good for the reader too. They know that I'm going to reputable sources. So yeah. You know, give some credibility. So I'd like to start with that. Who was the very first? tavern owner in New Jersey, as far as you know? As far as I know, in the research I've done, there was a man named uh, Mr. Lyon, Henry Lyon, and he was a Scotsman. L-Y-O-N. L-Y-O-N. Yeah. And uh, he was one of the pioneers of Newark. Newark's, the Newark was founded in 1666, and um, we're very fortunate, and I was very fortunate for this book, we have a lot of the primary source documents. We've got notes from the when the when the town councils would meet and when the and when the colonial assemblies would meet, and uh, and then there's other references to uh, things in books. So uh, it, there was a in January of 1668, uh, the Newark town council, the town elders, um, they said that uh, Mr. Lyon should be as soon as possible open an, a tavern, or an ordinary as it was called, for the entertainment uh, entertainment of travelers uh, and, and local people. And he was also, he was, he was an important person. He was the town treasurer, okay. and he went on to become a, he was, was a politician, things like that, so he was a good choice. And um, I learned that not only Newark, but many or most um, villages during the colonial period basically made it a rule that you had to have a tavern because they realized that people were traveling throughout. It was an important part of business. It was an important part of the social life, too. So, uh, so the taverns were really, really kind of mandated in a way. So, so painting with a broad brush, what's the main idea behind this book? I wanted to show people, I'm, I'm always interested, but New Jersey, that's all I write about is New Jersey. Yeah. And my publisher. That's what I do in this show. That's right. <laughs> and my publisher, they the the mantra is you know local history local history yeah so i'm i'm good with all that um and i wanted to i wanted to kind of do a deep dive into this part of history i'm not a revolutionary war historian but i as i was doing the research i just i found it fascinating all these things i was uncovering and and i never knew that and i would and i would check in other books lots there's been lots of good books written about the revolutionary war days but I didn't find any of this information, at least not on a large scale. So I, after doing some due diligence, um, I kind of thought I had a book. And I, I t mentioned yeah. it to my publisher. And, uh, and I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to explore this whole area of what, you know, what was life like back then? Yeah. It's, uh, you know, what, did, what did people have for breakfast is the, yeah. is the old joke. So. Yeah. And, and who's the target audience for this book, would you say? I'm hoping, well, so far, so good. I've been... Uh, all the, all the places that have been in, inviting me to do presentations and lectures, um, I've gotten very good response. So I think New Jersey people in general have a good sense of of history or, or, or wanting to learn more about history. So there's a New Jersey audience. There is a big uh, Revolutionary War 
colonial audience out there. There's hundreds and hundreds of people turn out every year for the uh, the Battle of Monmouth reenactment. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, and and things like that. So I th you know that and that was actually actually that's one of the questions when I present an idea to the editorial board of my publisher. They they ask me straight out, you know, well, who who do you think you know who are you gonna who is going to read this book? Mm. And I you know I got to come up with a good answer, and that, yeah. so there's that. And I just hope, generally speaking, I hope there's a there's a there's an audience out there, maybe outside of New Jersey, if they if they if they liked it. I, yeah. I, th I thought there was so I, I thought I thought it had some legs. I yeah. thought there was a there was a story to tell, and that's the, that's the thing. I'm telling stories. Yeah, I'm telling stories. That's the thing. Human interest stories. Yeah. And how did you get started on this topic? Kind of funny. Um, back in 2016, I published a book on New Jersey folk revival music. I remember. And if you uh, if you follow my my uh, my crazy logic, I say that the the folk revival started in New Jersey. But that's another story. Yeah. So one of the aspects of early days of folk music, this music that's handed down generation to generation, and basically people have forgotten who the original author was, but people, this is part of their lives, this is what they, they, they do in their, it's part of their culture. So back in the 1700s, uh, and even the, in the late 1600s, there would be, people would, would socialize at a village tavern, and they would go, to, go there and sit around the, uh, the fireplace, and somebody would get up, and sing a cappella, no, yeah. and they they sing songs from from Scotland or Wales or Ireland, and then and then and everybody would join in, and so that was that's the folk music tradition. Yeah. And I said, you know, that's pretty interesting. Okay, that's uh, that's that's kind of then people come together in a village and do this. I also found out that if you wanted to be really sociable back in those days, and if you're looking for a wife or a husband, you had to learn how to dance. Uh -huh. Dancing was very important, and the fiddle. Was the main instrument? Uh -huh. Guitars back back that early. The fiddle. So that I, you know, I came across. All, I was doing the research, but I, I had to keep my focus on folk music. And so, but I I saved my notes and I saved some of the things I had gathered. I just kind of put it aside. I made a mental footnote. I said, yeah, I should come back to this. This kind of this seems kind of interesting. Well, I did go back to it, and I just kept a good reporter always follows your sources, and the more I got into it back again and I kept finding more and more interesting things about well this is about you know Tad well this is where the militias mm. were formed went back in those days and this is where and George Washington would commandeer taverns as his headquarters and this is where the committees of safety which mm -hmm. basically there, there was no strong central government it was all these little regions and municipalities they basically ran things they they settled disputes over property and and finances and things like that um, I even I even found a, a legal scholar online, and he said that the meetings at taverns are basically the that's that's what led to the assembly clause in the Constitution, uh. and so things kept adding up here, and I kept making these connections, and I I said, you know, I I think I got a book here. This is uh. I have not I haven't seen anything else like this before. So uh, and then I presented the idea. To so I did my due diligence, and then I presented the idea to the publisher, and we have a good business. We have a good friendship relationship. We have a good business relationship, and they said, "Okay, go ahead, sign a contract." <laughs> That's a very interesting story about how the origins came about. Yeah, so start start with folk music and segues into tavern. Right, right. So that leads to my next question: How is the book structured? Well. In the beginning, all right, so I do my due diligence, I yeah. sign my contract, and now in the beginning process, uh, I'm thinking like a reporter, because I mean, that's, I was a journalist all my life. So I'm, I'm gathering information like a reporter. I'm interviewing people around different, different local historians like a reporter. Uh, I'm doing research like a reporter. I'm writing like a reporter. So I, I kept following my sources, and in the beginning, you're just gathering. You just, yeah. anything, just, it's just all the information you could grab. Mm. And you kind of reach you reach sort of an initial um, you, you reach a point uh, where you say you know I think all right I, I'm asking myself questions as I go along, and uh, you reach like a critical mass. You say I, I think it's it's kind of here now. Let's let so I start then I start breaking it off and I start 
I start organizing it into chapters. Uh -huh. And then I do that, that's kind of a first draft. And then as I'm going along, I'm finding new information. So I said, well, this is pretty good. I think I'm gonna take this out and put that, you know, because I have to keep a very conscious of word count. So, so, uh -huh. and that's what, that's, so it, it kind of, it works itself out that way. So, um, so I, 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 I get the chapters in mind and I try to write a nice introduction and I try to write a nice epilogue. That's where I can kind of stretch out a little bit. So mm. that's, that's, how it, that's how it comes together. And then I'm also thinking of photographs too, uh. as I'm going along. The research won't do it because I, I did a lot of road work. I, did, I tr went all around New Jersey. I'm, I'm a pretty good photographer. And so I'm thinking, I always think, you know, show and tell, you know, like kind of like the front page of a newspaper. Picture story. That's what I'm thinking as I'm as yeah. I'm doing all this. So that's 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 how I do it. Yeah. That's how I do it. What, what do you enjoy most about this creative process? Uh, you've done so many books now. You must enjoy what you're doing. I, I mainly enjoy the creative process. I enjoy doing my road trips. I enjoy meeting people. I enjoy hearing the local historians. I enjoy finding things, finding out stuff that maybe people weren't that much aware of or yeah. never knew. As a reporter, you're always looking for the scoop. Well, I mean, you can't do a, you can't have scoops when you've got a three-year project. So I'm trying to I'm trying to enlighten people. I'm trying to I'm trying to f present things that maybe they never thought of in a certain way. So that's that's the most important thing. And then the writing comes, and then the the, the writing is work. The writing is work. The editing is more work. So, yeah. uh, so it's the research part that you enjoy the most. That's what I like. Yeah. yeah. That's what I like. It's come to think of it, that's, I think probably feel the same way. I mean, the writing is can be drudgery. It's, it's hard work. Well, uh, you, well you, once you get everything, but in the researching, you're 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 always stumbling upon these like new little ideas that say, "Oh, gee, that never that never occurred to me. Yeah, it, I never knew that." I think they'd say that's an aha moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, this is, there's a lot of those yeah. as you're going along. Yeah. So, have you been pleased with the reception of your book? Very much so. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Yes, I've I've. Uh, Working with my publisher, I, dra I got together, we put together a, a, a little author tour for myself. <laughs> so that, started in, uh, that started in May. I, I was invited to go out to uh, Bordentown, which is on the west coast of New Jersey along the Delaware River. And we had a nice reception there. And then I did actually two trips out to Haddonfield, which is another, that, that, that whole western corridor of New Jersey, that's the colonial corridor. That's uh, it's very historic yeah. places out there. So I, I, did, I did two presentations there. I'm a member of the Nutley Historical Society. I, we, had a, we had my uh, opening reception at the Nutley Museum. A lot of people turned out, sold a lot of books. Um, and uh, so far, so good. We had, we even had a, um, I met, I met these uh, really nice chaps. They're in Morristown. And about two years ago, they started a, a brewery. Uh. And the, the beer is very good. <laughs> and uh, a source of mine introduced me. They said, you should really talk to these guys. Because I, I went there, I went there, brought them a book. I introduced myself. And they said, you know, yeah, we're, we're actually thinking about, we wanted to do like a colonial tavern night. So I said, well, <laughs> oh, gee, uh, it just happens to be the title of my book. So that happened um, last week. It was wow. Friday night, and a big turnout. It was actually, I, I didn't realize it. it was a private party. They sold tickets, and a lot of, again, a lot of people interested, sold a lot of books. Wow. Um, this Saturday, I'm going down to, uh, to White Spog in the, in the Pine Barrens. Huh. I got an inv invitation down there. So, so far, so good. So far, it's been, it's been well received, and, uh, and yes, yeah, so when the books sell, yeah. it's, it's very nice, very rewarding. One interesting idea that I kind of picked up from your book um, and maybe you can elaborate on it a little bit, but the way I understand it is, starting in the early 1700s, mm -hmm. most New Jerseyans thought of themselves as loyal British subjects. Yes. But then along comes the French and Indian War, 1763. Mm -hmm. How did that change things? See, again, that, that, was, that was a revelation to me. Um, there's a there, there's a professor at uh, uh, where is he from Rutgers Camden uh, nice guy his name is uh, here uh, I should be wearing my glasses again Andrew Shankman he's um, he's down at the, he's a professor of history at, at Rutgers University Camden ah. and again I was a source of mine said you should really talk to this guy he knows a lot well 
I always thought that it was sort of, it, it was just going to be like, it had to happen. There would have been like a big buildup, and then, and then the, the, everybody wanted to have their own independence and freedom. Not so. All those early years, he, and he explained this with his sources, he said, everybody thought, the, thought of themselves as loyal British subjects, and they were happy to be part of the colony. And they, this was, a revolution would have been like unheard of. They would, you know, because everybody was creating their, new, their own new lives here. This was the new world. And you're right, after the French and Indian War, 1760s, things started to change. There started to be more taxes imposed on people. They didn't so much mind the taxes. They mind they, they minded it's the taxation without representation. Uh -huh. They thought it should be the local governing agencies in New Jersey that should be in charge of the taxes, not some faraway king uh -huh. across the ocean. That they didn't like, because to them that was tyranny. And friction started to happen, and people started to talk. They started to talk in taverns. Huh. Taverns were the seed beds of the revolution. Huh. And you know, gee, I don't like the, I don't like these taxes either. And then you know, did you hear what happened the other day? And the, the British soldiers were there. So these animosity you know, it was like fueling the fire here. Uh. And then at some point, you know, it was, it just it got to the point where they just said, you know, we want to be, you know, we don't think we should be part of the colony anymore. And the the uh, New Jersey General Assembly meeting in Haddonfield, uh, and there there is still the, the the primary source documents that that state lay this out. They passed an ordinance in September 1777, and they said that from here on in, it was supposed to be a a a, 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 a new law about. Um, legal documents and and deeds and property from here on in new jersey is to for all these documents we're supposed we, we should be referred to as a state not a colony now think about what's going on the, the war had already started new jersey basically threw its hat in the ring it's like state not a colony you don't have to be too too imaginative imaginative wow. to realize you know king george sorry we're not interested anymore wow so that's and now, you know, and then Lexington and Concord, you know, when the first shots mm. were fired, um, there was no turning back. That was it. Yeah. And that was it. Yeah. Well, picking up on that, we often think Lexington and Concord, Revolutionary War, Massachusetts. But how is it that New Jersey is called the crossroads of the revolution? Yes, I, I'm a very, very proud Jersey guy. We, uh, we absolutely are the, we're the diner capital of the world. We are... <laughs> We are, uh, we definitely are the crossroads of the revolution, the, the cockpit of the revolution. More battles were fought here, more important things happened here. George Washington spent most of his time here. There was important stuff in Virginia and South Carolina and New York, sure, okay. Um, but this is where everything was happening. This, more battles. More battles, more encampments, more big events, more time with George Washington and his and his uh, and his uh, his generals. This is where the historic retreat of 1776. They came through New Jersey, they crossed the river, and then came back. And that was, mm. I think George Washington must must have known that this is it, boys. If we fail here, it's all all is lost. So, yes, every lots of stuff happened here in New Jersey. What the state doesn't. You know, we should we should have a we should have a a, a, a history tourism thing. The the, lo the local towns do a pretty good job of it, but you know, New Jersey really doesn't. Pl All right, they have some things, but you know, they, they should. I mean, they should really make a, a point of saying that you know, New Jersey is the crossroads of the revolution. This is where everything happened. So, I I was discovering that too as I went along, and you know, and then the taverns played a role in that. Uh, so yeah, this is. Uh, New Jersey always gets a short shrift. J just in this example. <laughs> yeah. Um, Ken Burns did that thing about Benjamin Franklin. That's a, he had a, you know, the documentary. All right, Benjamin Franklin, he left Boston. His brother was mistreating him. He came to New York, and then he went to Philadelphia. Boy, <laughs> you, missed, you missed Benjamin Franklin's long walk through New Jersey and all the things that he did and the taverns that he went to. It's like New Jersey always gets the short end of the stick. Well... One thing that's always bothered me, I, and I assume that you would concur, is, is you, we in New Jersey don't do a very good job with 
state highway historical signs. I mean, uh, I grew up in Virginia, and in Virginia, they're very good about mm -hmm. here's here's the historical marker, and you can pull off the highway to read the historical mm -hmm. marker, yeah. and there's historical markers everywhere. It seems to me in New Jersey, I don't see too many state official highway markers. Yeah, and it, it's local. We have some, and I, I actually put pictures of those. Yeah, in, yeah. Because I think that's important. That's you know, but, it marks. You know, you're, you're walking in the in the same footsteps as as these yeah. things happen. But, but I think it's a weakness that we we need more historical markers. Uh, it's a, yeah, come on, Trenton. Let's get going down there. Huh? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> well, anyway, moving along. The U.S. Constitution, freedom of assembly, what's that, what's that got to do with taverns? Well, I just, again, you, 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 always, you never know what you're, what you're going to find on the Internet. These yeah, days. yeah. I, I came across this essay uh, written in some West Coast, uh, from some West Coast uh, or legal organization. And I was looking through, and I just happened to stumble upon this, this one man, and he wrote, he, he said that, you know, the taverns, the... Uh, you know the source of, of the, the assembly clause in the in the Constitution. Again, this is one of these revelation moments. Like, oh my God, can I can I find this guy? Well, if you, I found him. Aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> I found him. Yeah. And he was he couldn't been nicer. He was happy to talk to me, and he sent me some information. And so, yeah, when they would assemble, it was it was the patriots and the loyalists, and it seemed to me that they were doing this. They were sort of hiding in plain sight. Um, if, if the Patriots, because the, the British authorities were always on the lookout now, they knew something was cooking. So if they were, if they went out to some, some old cabin way out in the woods someplace and met secretly and the British found them, well, oh, now we got these guys, we, you know, we, we caught them. But if you're in a tavern, which is a public facility, you know, okay, we're here with our buddies talking, you know, rrr, 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 rrr. hi guys, rrr, rrr, rrr. And uh, that's, so they're hiding in plain sight. They're doing this at the tavern. So then, I never thought of that. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, then, so now they're, you know, they have the, they have the right to meet and assemble and they did it. That's like, again, the seabeds of the revolution. This is the tavern. Ah, so, yeah. so that's what, that's when, that's what they, and he did a really nice job of explaining that. Ah. And, uh, and you know, he said, "I know a lot of people disagree with me, but yeah. but I said, well, I don't. That sounds it sounds good to me." Yeah. So, <laughs> a follow up: Where were the taverns generally located? Taverns were usually in the they were the hub, they were the center of town. Um, they were always located along the colonial highways, which were really the Native American trails. A lot of taverns were located along the rivers and the ferry ports. Um, it was a hospitality business, basically. I kind of suspect, you mentioned along the river, maybe, I, I don't know, but maybe a grist mill would come along, yeah, yeah. and then and then a blacksmith shop, yes. and then and then a tavern, right, something right, like that. Right, because then, and then as, uh, when, when farmers were taking their goods to market, you know, the ferries were, were very dependent on the uh, on the tides. Yeah. So you might, you might cross the river and be busy all day and come back and, well, Sorry, the boat can't run now, so you have to stay somewhere. Well, you stay at a tavern. You get yeah. something to eat, get something to drink, get a nice cozy floor to sleep on. <laughs> yeah. And and that's uh, yeah. that was business. This is business. Same thing with the on the on the routes. This is yeah. it's a it was a hospitality yeah. business basically. And something interesting you mentioned and you can elaborate on. In what sense would you say that the taverns represent a physical internet? That's I, I again when I you're you, just playing with idea. Yeah, you're as, as I'm moving along. Um, I kept reading about how um, if you were, especially if you were a traveler, if you weren't from around this area, and the, the tavern keeper, he was he or she. There were a lot of women tavern keepers. Um, they knew who everybody was in the village. But when a when a, a, a traveler would come in and sit down, and want a drink. And oh, hello! What's your name? Oh, my name is you know is John Kirby. Oh, really? And where are you from? Oh, I'm from Massachusetts. Oh, really, John? What's going on up in Massachusetts? Well, you know we're having some problems up there. Right? What what kind of problems? So the tavern keeper was taking in all this information. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is all no cell phones. <laughs> you know, very few newspapers. They were they were they were organizing and keeping all this oral current events that were happening so yeah so that's uh that okay. that's, it was it was like an internet this is where your sources of, of information yeah. came i'm sure they uh i'm sure as you 
told the stories and had a few more glasses of rum. It, it got a little more colorful and colossal, but yeah. but basically the information was there. So yeah, that's yeah. Uh, that's that's the idea of a, of a tavern as the internet port. Yeah. And perhaps you can speak a little bit about the role of Thomas Paine in New Jersey and the revolution. Yeah. Thomas Paine, again, I kind of knew of Thomas Paine. I didn't really know much about him or yeah. his life. Or, um, he was very important in in during the revolution. He came over from London. He was a he met with Benjamin Franklin. Ben, ben Franklin said, "You know, you really should go. They they really need your help over there in 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 in, in America." So. Um, he wrote all these essays and pamphlets, and a lot of his thinking, I think a lot of that was kind of a precursor to our Declaration of Independence and also our Constitution. And he also joined with George Washington. He was on that historic retreat, and he wrote, and then he, as soon as they got down, he went over to, to Philadelphia and he, and he published his essay, The Crisis. Now, if you read that, <laughs> He's right about New Jersey. <laughs> he said, "Oh, if there was only a Jersey made that would come down from the heavens and you know help our cause." And as he's writing about New Jersey, it's like uh -huh. you know Thomas Paine was like he was like uh, I, there's a Thomas Paine Society, and I interviewed the president, and you know wow. Thomas Paine was like in that era he was like the best known person in the world. He, all these ideas came from you know, you know separation of church and state, and all the all these fundamental ideas that we have here. That's what he was he was writing about. That was, he, was, he was writing about all that stuff. And then Bordentown was his, that was his spot. That was his, he, had, he had a favorite watering hole there too, so. And as a fellow author, I have to ask the question, does, does the, the writing energize you or exhaust you? It energizes me. Oh, that's good. It energizes me. Um, and once I'm on track, I can kind of, I start seeing beginning, middle, and end. Each, each chapter, I've never written any short stories or novels, but I think the way I write is sort of like in a short story kind of form, because I'm always thinking how, I'm always trying, it's, it's always about the narrative. I'm always trying to create a narrative. I'm mm -hmm. trying to tell a story. And it's difficult sometimes because this is a three-year project. So I have to, the narrative has to be consistent from the beginning to the end. You know, and as you're writing, so so yeah. When I when I start seeing the finish line, that's I'm I'm going, I'm moving. Yeah. And what's the best way to market your book? Well, my publisher takes care of most of that. They put stuff out. Mm. And, you know, they they sell it. They sell it. They have their own website, so they sell it through Arcadia History Press. They sell it on online Amazon. The the bookstores sell it. Um, and then when I go to do my presentations, I get invited to libraries and, and museums and historical societies. They want me to bring copies of the book because people are there, the audience shows up, they want to buy it and they want they want so, me to sign it. So some, sometimes Arcadia books, I even see them in the supermarkets. So. They, they, there's, a, there's a guy, he came up through the business about three or four years ago now, he's the CEO, nice chap, I've talked to him once or twice, very, very savvy when it comes to the publishing business. and. Uh, he decided, he's, yeah, you know, why not put them in the WalMarts and put them in CVS, you know, and they they called they, the, my my, almost, my marketing person almost like me. a postcard. Yeah, she said, she said, what do you think of this idea? I said, what do I think? It's great. Come on, <laughs> more pairs of eyes the better. That's you go. You got my my blessing. Go ahead. And it's yeah. now, and now on Facebook, people will say, oh, I was at the Walmart the other day and look what I found. They they <laughs> they, they send me a, a picture from their from their cell phone. Yeah, great. Okay. So it's a fascinating book, um, and I've read it with interest. Now that it's out, is there anything that, that you had to leave out that, that you wanted to include? A lot, lots, lots of stuff, a lot of outtakes for sure. Because uh -huh. as you're going along, you, you know, you, something comes along, you say, oh man, this is really good. I, yeah, I, let me take this out. So yes, there's a lot, a lot of stuff that didn't get into the book. Um, it just because I, you know, again, the word the word count keeps you honest. You know, once once I sign the contract, that you know, I, I call my my acquisition editor. I say, okay, how about two thousand more words? And, no, 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 no. You got <laughs> wow. No, no, you got because you know it's all about the economics. It's you know it has to be a certain size and it's got to be it's got to fit this. You know, only a certain amount of words will do that. So, but there's that. So yes, there are a lot of outtakes, and they're all also the research doesn't stop once this book is out. 
people now come to me and say, oh, did you know about this tavern? Uh, no, I didn't. Oh, we could wait a minute. Tell me a little bit more about it. So now, now, I've, now I started a new file of <laughs> taverns I didn't know about, I call it. <laughs> and so that's now that's part of the, yeah, that's, that's like a whole new strain of this. So Taverns part two. Well, maybe, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. But, but Michael, I want to thank you for coming here to East Brunswick today. And it's been a real pleasure talking to you about this wonderful book. Angus, it's always a pleasure. I, I think this is the third time I've been on your yeah. show. Yeah. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's really an honor. I, okay. I really appreciate it. That's very nice of you.